Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here um, or watching after the fact. We will be discussing this evening some updates to our UTA ordinances. My name is Megan Waters. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at UTA, and I'm joined today by Tim Merrill with our Utah Attorney General's Office. Um, I'm going to hand the time over to Tim as well as the um, mouse control. So, Tim, please take it away. All right, thank you. As Megan mentioned, my name is Tim Merrill and I'm an Assistant Attorney General who represents UTA and I am assisting uh, UTA with updating their ordinances that um, have not been updated in some time. And we have broken it up here, as you can see, uh, for ordinances governing fair payment, uh, criminal conduct that is prescribed, and also finally, when an individual may be trespassed from UTA property and or services. After I give a very brief overview of the ordinances, the purpose of this meeting is we wanna hear from you. Um, the purpose of reaching out to the public is that we wanna be responsive uh, to the needs of our community. So we're glad for those of you who have joined us. And, uh, and after the questions and answers, um, we'll wrap this up. Uh, Megan, I have keyboard control. What do I press to move the slide forward? Your, do your arrow keys work? No, let's mm. see. There you go. Oh, I just clicked my mouse. Did I do that? Yep. <laughs> okay, my mouse works. Good well, work. <laughs> It wouldn't be a proper meeting without some kind of technological hiccup, but now we can move forward. Uh, UTA is a um, creation of the state. It's a political entity or subdivision of the state of Utah. And we are a statutory creation called a large public transit district. When I say we, I am referring to UTA. UTA is entrusted by the state uh, to carry forth its purposes of bringing connectivity, access um, to transit. And uh, so one of the things that we'll be talking about tonight is how these ordinances assist UTA in accomplishing its directives as given it by the state. Some of the goals we uh, wanted to achieve in this update was to increase compliance um, educate the public about what we're doing to make it them more transparent, and then refine our internal processes in regards to enforcement to make sure that we have uniformity and consistency in how we're applying these ordinances. In terms of who has contributed to this process, I would say that they have touched just about every corner of UTA's um, operations. We have had the police department, um, the operations department, we've had planning and real estate, uh, legal, um, and many others who have provided internal input. And that's how these ordinances have come to be in the shape they're in for us to present to you. The fair payment ordinance has six sections. Uh, the first section, this is kind of the legal jargon, where it defines terms so that we all know what we're talking about. The issue with any legal drafting is the problem called equivocation, where I might mean one thing by using a term, and you might understand that thing to be mean something different. So the reason we have definitions is so that everyone understands what we're talking about. Also, it, um, it will be going over fair payment. Every time that you write a trip, take a trip on UTA, either you'll have a, a card or a ticket or some proof of fair media that shows that you're entitled to be writing the service. Now, if a person does not have that proof of fair payment, um, then there are enforcement procedures that can subject an individual to a fine if a person feels like they were wrongfully fined, they can protest it to UTA's hearing officer. 
And if they're dissatisfied with the hearing officer's decision, they can appeal to an appeals officer. So that's a very brief overview of the fair payment ordinance. So <clears throat> regarding fair payment, um, this section describes what would be um, valid fair payment. So if you have duplicated, for example, I'm looking at the third bullet, bullet excuse me, bullet point. Um, if for example, uh, counterfeited or photocopied or, or, or have given it to somebody who is not entitled to it or using something that's expired or uh, traveling under false pretenses, those would be things that we are examples of someone who is trying to evade fair payment. And the purpose of this ordinance is just to make sure that uh, everybody takes accountability and responsibility for their um, part in making the transit system function and work um, as it's been designed to in a fair and reasonable manner. Whoops, I think I went the wrong way. Um, here we are. So the way that fares are enforced at UTA is that uh, the transit police officers who are certified through the Police Officer Standards and Trainings uh, Division of the State of Utah. So they're, law they're official law enforcement officers. These are not um, security guards or something like that. These are formal police officers. They will go through the um, vehicles and the trains at UTA and do um, random, random checks. And if you have ever ridden on the services, you likely have um, gone through this process, so I, I don't need to describe it for those of you who have any familiarity with UTA, but they'll ask for our proof of our fair media. And so once that's given them, they move on. And if a person does not have fair media, then they might be asked to get off and purchase it, um, or they might be given a warning, or they could be given an administrative ticket, and they'll have to pay an administrative fine. So for a first offense, because everything UTA does is not intended to be punitive, but educative. And what we wanna do is simply um, educate the public on our policies and writer rules so that everyone um, can ride and get along without any issues. And so the first offense would be a $25 fine. And a person may pay that uh, to UTA in person by, by mail through an online portal. So there, there's, we try to make it as convenient and as accessible as possible to individuals to pay that fine. If there's a second or subsequent offense, so the person did not learn their lesson the first time, uh, the fine is enhanced and it goes up to $90. If a person is um, economically disadvantaged, there's some alternatives which UTA would like to offer them, such as community service or to be enrolled in a safety class, which is UTA's equivalent of traffic school, if anyone has ever gotten a speeding ticket, which will then be used in lieu of fine. Finally, there are individuals who are ticketed who don't do anything with the ticket, and the tickets become delinquent and just sit there. So they would be assessed a one-time delinquent fee of $10. Now, the most, uh, and, and as, a, as a lawyer, I really enjoy the due process portion of this, um, which we'll talk about now because you're going to see it repeated in the next um, couple of categories. So uh, the right of due process under the 14th Amendment allows us as citizens the opportunity to be heard and to participate. In, in, in instances where we're given a ticket so that things are not done unilaterally or without notice to us, but that we can be part of um, um, challenging the ticket is really our substantive right. So at UTA, there is a hearing officer. You can uh, call the hearing officer if you'd like to discuss the ticket. You can formally uh, protest it and then the hearing officer will review the case with you and decide whether the ticket was appropriately administered or not. 
if, if it's uh, dismissed at that point, then a person would not pay any fine. If the hearing officer upholds the ticket, then the person would then be um, given time to pay the fine so they could discuss, look, I need 30 days or 60 days or 90 days to arrange payment. Um, or if the person is dissatisfied, then finally their um, final administrative remedy is to go to the appeals officer and that process will be repeated as was done before the hearing officer, where the appeals officer will decide if the hearing officer's decision was correct or incorrect. So there's a hearing officer and an appeals officer. It's easy to confuse the two. Now we have a brief Q&A. If you do have a question, um, I believe you can, uh, Megan, do they type it in or do they raise their hand or how does that work? Yeah, either way. So we have one attendee on. Um, Mike, if you want to raise your hand or if you want to type any questions that you have throughout the presentation in the chat, that's a great way. Um, and, and feel free to save them for the end too. We can we can um, do a, a larger Q&A at the end if there are more questions. I'm also watching our live stream and there are no questions there either. So I think we are okay to move forward. Yep, he says no questions. Thanks for Thanks for that. Thank you very much. We're glad you're here listening in. Well, I will now proceed to our, our next category, uh, criminal ordinances. This is what Front Runner, by the way, looked like tonight. I guess all of the high schoolers were returning from Lagoon, and there was standing room only on Front Runner. I haven't seen it so busy ever. So in the criminal ordinance, again, we have definitions and then we have the statutory enabling authority where um, UTA is authorized to pass its own ordinances. The rules of construction are going to refer to um, how uh, the language should be construed so that there is lesser of a chance for ambiguity or vagueness. Um, the codes that we will adopt directly from the Utah statutes then the seriousness or classification of offenses. And then we'll look at the specific types of things that UTA wants to regulate, including vehicles, use of its transit facilities, conduct, its property. And finally, if someone does happen to um, do something that violates these ordinances, what will happen? M many, uh, Many of the things in these ordinances, rather than duplicating them, because then these ordinances could have been hundreds of pages long, it's much more uh, it's much simpler to simply adopt the state uh, criminal codes and incorporate them into UTA's ordinances, because, for example, the state has something like public intoxication or assault, rather than redefine what that is and how that looks on, on UTA uh, vehicles or property, we have incorporated the criminal code, the code of criminal procedure, the Drug Paraphernalia Act and the Controlled Substances Act, the traffic code for all of the movement in and out of our parking facilities and transit facilities, the Indoor Clean Air Act, which is really just about smoking, and the railroad, railroad code. Okay, so those are the codes which really apply directly to UTA and our operations. There are different classifications, meaning how seriously can we be punished if we offend one of these um, uh, crimes? So the lowest level is an infraction and then above an infraction or misdemeanors. And they go from the lowest level, class C, to a class B, to the highest misdemeanors, class A. And then jumps up to felonies. And there's a third degree, second degree, first degree, and then there's a capital felony. So what we wanted to do is whatever the state has chosen to classify the offenses as, UTA will just match whatever that classification is. But Whenever there is a unique ordinance that's UTA specific, then we're just going to classify it as an infraction. The benefit uh, uh, of an infraction for those who um, don't wanna to go to jail, then you're in luck because you cannot serve any hard time from an infraction. You're only subject to a fine. 
uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, time is spent in enforcing the parking restrictions at our park and rides and other facilities. Um, we don't want people, for example, marketing their trailers or their uh, disabled vehicles in our parking lot. So, so we want to make sure our park, parking lots allow for free flow of uh, pedestrians and active uh, transportation and vehicles in and out. So we want to avoid any situation where there are obstructions or other things that make our facilities less safe to the public. It also defines uh, what the transit facilities may be used for and not used for. So the purpose for our transit facilities is again for the movement of people. <clears throat> some, some of the prohibited conduct, for example, uh, would be something like hanging on to the exterior of a vehicle while, while it's in motion, um, throwing things out the window and, and hitting somebody, assaulting an operator. Um, occasionally people have questions about animals. So the, under federal law, service animals are defined as a dog. So the only kind of animal that can serve, I suppose, <laughs> according to the US government, are canines. So if you have a dog, then you may um, bring the dog onto UTA services as a service animal. If the animal has been trained to assist an individual with a specific disability. So comfort animals are not permitted um, in, in the sense that service animals are, but if you have any pets um, under reasonable um, conditions, if, they, if you can put them in a cage, um, you can bring them with you. So the purpose for that is that uh, people don't buy a passenger ticket for their animal to sit next to them. But if you can um, have it in a cage and put it where it will not obstruct people moving to and fro, um, then small animals are welcome. But large animals, I guess no horses on public transit. Of course, if you have a horse, you don't need to ride public transit. So in terms of property, UTA maintains a lot of right of way. We have corridor for our trains. We have uh, property that's used for maintenance facilities and administrative offices. Uh, so we want to prevent people from trespassing or from uh, encroaching on UTA property. One of the situations that we're particularly concerned about is adjoining homeowners will sometimes look out their back window and say, oh, I my property line goes up against the UTA right of way. And then there's this beautiful trail up there. So I'm going to terraform um, UTA's uh, right of way up to the trail and plant, plant things and maybe put in some steps. And um, here's a chicken coop. We'll put some chickens out there. And what most people don't know is that with, with, with um, railroad right of ways, they are heavily regulated because of environmental contamination. And so we don't like people disturbing the dirt or doing anything within our right of way. There are specific processes that we follow under the federal and Utah Department of Environmental Control, Control and Quality that uh, protects the public. And so we don't want anyone putting a trampoline out on our right of way or, or doing anything like that. So that's some of the things that you'll find in the ordinance there. Finally, um, all of these criminal ordinances will be enforced by our police department. So the transit police officers can go out and investigate and they are under state law um, authorized and have jurisdiction to issue tickets to anybody who violates these ordinances. These, or, um, these tickets will not be resolved through UTA's administrative process. They will go to the local jurisdiction's court, either the justice court or the district court. And then they will have to work uh, through the court system um, by um, either you know, uh, pay, paying a fine or um, if there's a situation where the judge orders them to remove their chicken coop from UTA property, something like that. 
So that will be the enforcement arm is going to be through the courts. Okay, any questions uh, on, on this segment? <clears throat> Feel free to um, type in if you have any. We'll, we'll wrap up the ordinances with our final uh, trespassing ordinance. This is somewhat confusing because, again, I'm using the same term, trespassing, that we just talked about in a new way. Rather than addressing people um, who are trespassing, for example, and, and going through our right-of-way that shouldn't be, we're talking about UTA formally issuing a trespass order to prevent a person from um, either writing our services or from entering our property. And so <clears throat> we're gonna look at under what situations a person would be trespassed for a minor offense, and then a serious offense, and for the major offenses, which would potentially uh, cause a permanent trespass to be issued. So a minor offense is if someone has uh, committed a classy misdemeanor or, or um, three, uh, excuse me, uh, or any of the writer rules. So for example, let's, as a hypothetical, um, I'm having a bad day, I, I go on front runner and I decide to be disorderly and I become tumultuous and I'm loud and obnoxious and I disturb the riders. Well, I could be, um, you know, the police are called because of my disorderly conduct and they say, Tim, you know, we're gonna trespass you for 20, for 48 hours or for a week. Essentially, this is just a means by which we can allow people to step back, cool down, reset. So the length of trespass for a minor offense can be no more than 30 days. If I were given a trespass order, I wanna make sure that I understand what I am prohibited from. So the trespass order will include the reason I'm being trespassed, what I'm being trespassed from, and when the trespass will last until. And then finally, it'll inform me of my right to protest and appeal the trespass order. Well. A serious offense trespass is different in two important ways. First, you have to commit a crime that's a class B misdemeanor or greater, or accrue three minor offenses within 12 months. And then if that happens, a police officer could trespass me for up to one year. It doesn't have to be a year. It could be anywhere from 31 days to 365 days. And then the same due process rights on the notice. Now, unfortunately, there could be potentially a, a very um, serious crime that could result in, for example, death or any kind of felony offense committed in or, or upon a transit facility. The individual may be trespassed and given a permanent uh, trespass order where they're not permitted back. However, um, just like the Board of Pardons looks at a situation on a case-by-case -case basis, UTA feels like there needs to be a backdoor that an individual who has shown what they've um, essentially have um, done restitution and paid their debt to society, uh, they may petition for reinstatement of their rights to ride public transit no sooner than five years after the trespass order. So that is it, so, so a permanent trespass is at a minimum five years up until uh, could be longer. Now, all of these trespass orders are going to be issued by the police officers, but UTA is authorized that its operators can already eject unruly passengers for up to 24 hours. Now, if there's a situation where we're talking about paratransit and or contracted services, which would include something like our microtransit or VIA, then they have administrative processes they go to that are often drawn from our federal regulations 
And so um, this is not going to interfere with that administrative suspension. This will be different. Now the records of trespass will be classified as private. So a person, for example, filing a grandma request under the Freedom of Information would um, not be entitled to it uh, if it's an, an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. <coughs> a person may feel unjustly trespassed. And if that's the case, they can always come and protest to the hearing officer and the hearing officer will render a decision based on the evidence. And if the hearing officer upholds the trespass order, then they can appeal it to the appeals officer. Any questions about the trespass? Are there any ordinances you think we've missed that we, <laughs> we should um, go back to and and uh, rework, all right. Well, thank you, all of you who have attended. Uh, look forward, if you don't have any comments now, but you have some that come to you in the middle of the night, feel free to send them over to UTA and we'll be happy to look over them. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'll just wrap up by reiterating that we are taking comments from the public until June 10th. Um, we open the public comment period on May 11th um, and are accepting comments for a few more weeks, a couple more weeks. Um, you can find more information, read through the information that Tim shared, um, watch this recording when it's available in a couple of days, um, and read through the full ordinance documents at rideuta.com slash ordinances. If you do want to leave us a comment or submit any questions, you can contact us a couple of ways. We have a phone number that goes to our customer service team at 801-743-3882, option five. And you can always reach out to us via email at hearingofficer at rideuta.com. So with that, I am not seeing any questions or comments from our attendees or from our listeners on Facebook, um, Facebook Live. So we will go ahead and stop the recording, but please reach out to us, learn more, um, ask questions and, and provide your comments on this. Thank you so much. All right, Megan, is there a